what the, the main thing we're going to talk about is a stakeholder in a profitable farm business. How can we get nature working with us in our farm, farm businesses? And what we're going to talk about is the 80 plus farms that I have been to and reviewed in business terms and, and, and explain what we found out and why nature should be a stakeholder in a farm business. So we're going to cover various things. We're going to cover maximum sustainable output. You won't have heard of that, MSO. We're going to talk about variable costs and the different types of variable costs. And we're going to then see where the best place for a farm business to be is. And so, but we're going to start here, a farming and nature timeline. If you can't see it, move forward, move into the middle. Okay, yeah. thanks, uh, uh, Martin. So, oh, it's moved on. So, I'm starting with the end. Okay, this is as a result of the 80 farms we've seen, this is what we've learned that in the pre 1900s, farming was in equilibrium. As farming developed over the centuries, nature came with it, it was an iterative process. We've then gone into a non-equilibrium phase where the change in farming was fast-paced and nature couldn't keep up. And now we're talking about reversal, rewilding, and we're going to talk about how it's very difficult to go back to where we have been. In fact, in science terms, it is impossible. You cannot go back. And looking to the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we're going to talk about maximum sustainable output. Farming with nature, but to the natural production capacity of the land. So what we found is that there is something called free issue. As farm businesses, we receive for nothing, pro bono, we receive sunshine, rain, geology, soil fertility, and grass, and we are given that for nothing. If we weren't given it and we had to pay for it, we, our businesses would be even worse off than they are now. So we are given free sunshine, free rain, free fertility, free grass. Does that make sense? Does anybody want to question that, challenge that, have a question about that? Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, um, I just wasn't sure what you meant when you said um, we can't go back. I just missed that. Sorry. It, it, what, what are you saying that can't, we can't go back to? So it, what we, we're heading down a rewilding route in some areas. It's actually very difficult to go back to something 10 years ago, let alone 100, 200, 300 years ago. The third law of thermodynamics doesn't allow that and nor does the Markov chain which shows you the probability of going backwards. It is not possible to go back to where we were. So this concept of rewilding is fine except we can't achieve where we were 10, 20, 100 years ago. It's not, it's not possible scientifically. Species have disappeared. Are you saying that or are you saying that something more that um, it's a more, uh, it's a fuller argument about how landscapes change. It's a fuller argument. Right. It's not just about species. I mean, for example, the, the NO2 in the air at the moment is very different now to what it was 100 years ago. The, the parameters that are here now are very, very different. So one of the things I do when I go on farm is I do not tell farmers how to farm. What I do do is tell them where their business is. And what we've got on stage here, these two reprobates, are two, uh, two arable farmers who we've been working with, we've done the analysis on their numbers, and we're gonna, I'm gonna bring them in, and they're gonna chip in when I get things wrong. Uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna bring them in. And the first thing we're gonna start with is that all farm businesses have variable costs and fixed costs. Now I go on to farms, and sometimes, quite often, 
farms do not know the difference between variable costs and fixed costs. So at the risk of being patronising, all I've done is just list out some different variable costs, seed, fertiliser, pesticides, contract labour, fixed costs, examples, uh, rent, rates, insurance, labour, finance costs. The difference is that the variable costs are associated with driving volume and the fixed costs are there whatever your business, whatever the volume your business puts through. Does that all make sense? So we have these different variable costs. How do we do a farm business analysis? So we've got revenue and costs up the vertical axis, so output volumes on the horizontal axis, revenue line uh, going up. As your output volumes increase, so your revenue line goes up as well. Your fixed costs are, are, are the red line just here. And your variable costs are that, are that purple line. And where the variable costs cross the revenue line, break even, profit, and as you get bigger, so you deliver more profits. And that is what I was taught at Sealhane maybe some time ago, admittedly. And that is what is still taught now. That is the, the way we think farm businesses work. It is not like that. We think it's a win-win strategy. Unfortunately, this model is fundamental disagreement with the farming realities. So why is that? And it's, it's like that because variable costs can be divided down into two different types of variable costs. And this is where the free issue that I was talking about earlier comes in. So we have productive variable costs at the top there, PVCs, contract labor, harvesting, and seeds. And these are associated with the free issue, the working with nature, whereas the corrective variable costs, the artificial fertilizers, the sprays, are associated with substituting for nature, trying to drive production. So how does this work? Same chart, but I've, dot I've hashed and shaded the variable cost line because in agriculture, that's what happens. We get this inflection point at that point, at that point there. And so we then get a break back point where most of the farms I'm working with are up in here. They've, they're losing money. They've gone through a profitable stage and are losing money. And so at that inflection point is the point at which farming is at its most profitable. That point there, where the MSO is here, that is where farming is at its most profitable. It's also where nature is providing the most benefit. So there is a sweet spot where nature and farming coincide to the benefit of them both. And that is because the PVCs between here and here are associated with the free issue, and the CVCs are trying to drive production over and above the natural capacity of the land. Questions? <laughs> no. um, I can't see, are you talking about where your profitability is against your um, subsidies you're getting for wildlife? But surely all you've got to do is leave a little bit of land for nature without bringing all these figures into it. The farmers are so intensive, um, they don't just leave a little bit and they even get paid for it now, so what's the big... Yeah, you're complicating me, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> the, and, and the reason for the complication is because we have to prove that this actually is true. And so we now have a position where mathematics, economics, and science coincide to show where this is. And unless I can show in business terms why farmers should do less to be more profitable, I will be unsuccessful in explaining why farmers should move down a business route rather than pound notes. <laughs> you may well be right. 
So it, it, it is complicated. Okay. Any other questions about this? It, is it all clear? The one behind you. Oh, sorry. Um, one, uh, Fraser. Um, is, it, is that line much different to the sort of principle, because we've always had the principle of like fertiliser usage, haven't we, that there's a, there's a sort of sweet spot depending on price versus output. So I've never viewed variable costs as that straight line, if, and just, I'm just using fertiliser as the example. Is that, is that how that's working then? If, if you're using um, a marginal cost approach to variable costs, that isn't working in farming because they're no, you can't do a marginal cost approach because they're non-linear. No, and that's and it's exactly right. We all know the first bag of fur is probably more profitable than the last bag, and then we go over a threshold where we're just throwing money at it, aren't we? Yeah. And, th and that's how I view. Is that uh, my uh, interpretation? Very simple, just very using that one that one sort of input cost. Yeah. The, the key is that you have free issue, which has never been taken into account before, and it's the only industry that has that. Free bit is the bit if we don't put any on, isn't it? You yes. could argue. Yeah. 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 Exactly that. Now there was a question. The only issue I have with your free issue is the bit of soil fertility, because I don't necessarily think that's a free bit. I, I get the sunshine and the rain, but the soil fertility, I think we've come to expect to be there. And we've used n artificial fertilisers to achieve it, but the natural bit is if we use cover crops and cattle, or sheep or livestock or whatever. So the fertility bit is a bit very... I, I don't 100% I don't agree with you that the soil fertility is a freebie. Anything... If you, in, in your farm business, use a CVC, a corrective variable cost fertiliser or sprays, that is going to deplete the free issue that you go, are given for nothing. Uh, I'm organic. Fine. So I don't use bought in, but I still think your fertility is costing you something. Your fertility isn't for free. You, Mother Nature's not giving it to me unless I help Mother Nature to, to put something there. Are you, are you organic with stock? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they'll provide a lot of your, your Yeah, exactly. Your fertility. That's what I'm saying. So that, that's why I don't quite get your soil fertility is, is a given. Because it's a virtuous circle. Yeah. Fine. Anybody else? So w what we now know is that profits are maximised at that inflection point, that where the uh, CVCs go off at an angle. Break-even occurs much earlier than in the standard model, and we'll have a look at that on um, David and, P and Patrick's farms in a minute. And this, that inflection point has been de defined as the MSO, the maximum sustainable output. So, David, Patrick, why are you considering adopting MSO? So, um, I feel a bit like a guinea pig up here and uh, like a naughty child in the headmaster's office or something. Um, so when Chris started talking about this, um, it, it did pique my interest because whilst I'm, I haven't got a, a, what I'd call a, um, a really good academic grasp on accounting and finance and things like that, um, the journey that we're on on our farm in regenerative farming, um, we're, on this, we're on this journey I've done a lot of benchmarking with the HDB, looking at the, the sort of traditional um, side of costings with uh, fixed costs and variable costs. Um, but throughout that journey, I've never had this ability to be able to actually benchmark how sustainable my business is. So, yes, I can reduce my uh, corrective variable costs, my sprays and my fertilisers, which I've been doing. Um, but actually, the ability to see that my system is more sustainable, which is what MSO gives me, um, you know, the, the concept of it, I've, I've, I've not come across before. And it's been a bit of an education. And I, th and I think, going back to the gentleman over there talking about organic, I mean, theoretically, you should be at MSO if you're, up, if you're organic, but it's a journey, and every year it will be different. And over time, you'll be able to see that your business is becoming more sustainable because, theoretically, your MSO should keep edging to the right. So you'll make more money, fingers crossed. And I'm on a journey, I'm, I'm a conventional farmer using regenerative practices. Um, I'm still using pesticides, I'm still using fertilizer, but less of them. So I'm not going to be at MSO, but it is a journey. And as time goes on, it gives me that ability to uh, yardstick where I am and see that I'm making progress. Pat? Yeah, I think the reason I'm sitting here is because I've sat 
on the other side of Chris, like you are now, and I've pulled all the same faces, and I've sat there with my head spinning a couple of times, and I've, we've been working on this for probably 18 months, I think it was at the Oxford Real Farming Conference when Chris first floated the idea, and as a farmer trying to do the right thing, I really looked at it and thought, actually, you know what, this is, I can see the benefit of this, even if I don't understand it. And I, hopefully, as everyone is sitting there, you know, you, th there is, there's a concept here that can really work. So for me, for our farm, we're the HDB strategic farm for the East, but again, we're a big, heavy cereal farm. We're looking at regenerative techniques, but we also have, in fact, I should, shouldn't really admit it, but the picture of the blue bags was all our fertilizer store. So we, you know, we're kind of, we're on, this, on the same journey that David keeps talking about. But for us, for me, it's looking at how can I adopt a whole farm ecosystem approach? Because for me, it's how do we push what is in the barn to the maximum amount, for the maximum amount of money, by doing the least amount of damage to the environment and having the least amount of impact. Um, we've got other trials at the moment with the HDB where we're looking at um, wildflower strips, so looking at predatory insects, beneficial insects, how far they travel into a crop, and then I link that together looking at how we farm our arable crops, how we link that into our existing habitats, and then it's followed by a cover crop, cover crop then the, the benefits of that, clean water, and all of a sudden we've got this whole farm approach to our farmland ecosystem, and in the middle of that, is how do we grow arable crops in a way that keeps us in business, really, I guess is the key, the kind of fundamental element of it, doing as, as little impact as, as what we possibly can on the natural environment. So for me, that's why we're, we're on this journey, and I actually have a, a real interest in finding a way of explaining this so everyone understands it and everyone gets it. There's, you know, we can be bamboozled by acronyms and words, and I d whilst I do all our farm accounts, I don't think like an accountant. But what I want is, is another tool in the toolkit to really inform our decision making. And when I say that, for me, this whole process would work alongside our farm accounts, our farm budget, our farm ecological accounting and, uh, and reporting, that which we're doing all the time, and our farm car carbon audit as well. So they're all tools in the toolkit to actually come out with what is the best decision and the best way forward for our business. Thanks, Matt. Uh, any questions of the... Of Just over here. Graham. Sorry. I think it's more a comment, actually. I think when I'm getting, I mean, I'm, I've, I've done accountancy actually for three years, and I'm, I'm still finding it quite hard to engage with this, but that's not because you're wrong, because I'm struggling with some of the graphs and so forth. But what I was going to comment is that may, maybe what you're getting at is, is the thing that's missing from sustainability quite often, because we're all struggled with this term of sustainability and sustainable development is the natural component, because it seems to be quite often the natural part is missed out completely. Is that, is that right, Chris? Is that what you're getting at? It's actually bringing that back into the equation in a way that's very much been left out of it. Um, is, that, is that what I should be taking from this? Exa well, exactly that. Nobody has, uh, has accounted for that free issue that we get, whether it's soil fertility or not. We get free sunshine and free rain. And that creates an environment which we had to, pay, if we had to pay for as farmers, it would cost us a lot of money. And no one's taken that into account before. And that's what creates the non-linear variable costs rather than the linear variable costs, which if you go to account into our taught economics, the standard theory of the firm. We now have the, the realities of economics on the farm. And it, that's that free issue which drives everything. And that's why people who have reduced, we would, I was at a, a net zero um, talk earlier on, and people were talking about reducing output and making more money. That's what this does, and that's, this is why it actually happens. Is there any, is there any way that you could have managed it? Because people could have all of the natural resources, and just completely, completely ignore them, um, but it needs the management of those guys up there, or me, or John Arthur next to me, to actually employ and, uh, and to make value of, of, of those natural resources. So the management for me is a fixed cost, not a variable cost. And we'll come on to those in a minute. Um, what I'd like you to do is just in your mind, um, put, the, put that chart in, and we'll go to David. Talk to me. <laughs> right, so what we've got here is exactly the same chart as we had previously, but these are David's numbers, okay? So the MSO, 
um, is the um, orange line, perpendicular line. You can see the inflection point. You can see how David, with his PVCs, the purple line, has used his natural, naturally available fertility or free issue variable costs um, and then tried to drive the production. And the green line, which is the revenue line, you can see how much less he is making. If, he, if he'd been at MSO, if he'd had his farm business at MSO, his margin would be that much greater. So what I'm saying here is that his profit margin at the moment is this bracket here, profit margin at current output, and his profit margin at MSO is that bracket there. So he, he at MSO would make a lot more money. He would be more profitable. Not only that, nature, because of the reduction in fertilizer and sprays, is by default improving. Nature and farming coincide to their mutual benefit at that point. If David went too far to the left and didn't drive production towards MSO, not only would he not make any money, but the, the nature, because of the managed landscape, would be at disadvantaged as well. Silence. A lot of question marks. I can see all this. How do I calculate where my MSO is? Very difficult at the moment because we're using an algorithm um, to actually do that. It is possible to do it geometrically. We've done it algebraically. But in effect, all you have to do is to reduce your CVCs and gradually you'll get down to it to, to, to MSO. The one thing we've found or are finding is that particularly in livestock farms, less so in arable farms because we've only just started working with arable farms, but the, but the livestock farms, as they move to um, reduce their CVCs, the MSO is moving to the right automatically because their management is changing in the way they, op they, the way they manage their livestock and their land. So as for fertility, natural fertility builds up in the soil, the MSO is moving to the right. So uh, you know, I've had a couple of things. I've had two comments from farmers recently. One firm me up to say, a livestock farmer, well, both livestock farmers, one firm me to say, I've got a problem. You're now causing me too much tax. I'm paying more tax now than I ever used to. And the other was the, the farmer firm me to say, you advised me to, to do this over three or four or five years. I wish I'd done it over two. Now, the disadvantage of doing it over two is that you won't understand where your MSO, that MSO is going to move to the right as you improve your, your, your management of that fertility. Yeah. I think it's, it's a great question. And I think, Chris, one of the things probably to the point to make is that actually MSO isn't always in the right place. So the way, when our accounts come up in a minute, the way they've changed over the last, uh, last year to how this year is going to look is that our uh, fungicide bill last year was non-existent because it was so dry. This year it's a whole lot higher because of a damp May. It, it, everything's changed in terms of what we're, what we're applying. And that MSO is going to change every year. In some years, like this year, we're actually going to be looking at that thinking, you know what, we've spent more than that. So it's, it's remembering it's not in a fixed point, the MSO. But I think the other way of looking at it is actually it's a gut feeling is you kind of know by the number of blue bags you've got in the shed and how much, is, how much you're putting on. You know how much you're spraying. We know how hard we're trying to push it secretly between all of us, you know, can we get a bit more? Can we get a bit more? Do we need to get a bit more? Uh, and it's, it's kind of something that we just, we all know at the back of our minds as well. And I think the way the policy is moving is it's just gonna make us think in a slightly different way in, in how much do we put on and how much are we gonna get back? Of course, then the price of wheat changes and, and everything changes, and we can't account for any of that. But at this stage, you know, it's just it's keeping the, the mindset and it's keeping the way we think about actually the way we farm and is it the best way for our business and for the environment. Did you have a follow up? I was going to say so, what's the best way to start going towards reaching your MSO? Would it be to reducing your CVCs a little bit, a certain percentage every year? Because we don't really want to just jump off a cliff edge. And we don't. Well, yeah. The first thing is to be, which I th sounds as though you are, to be in a mindset to go down this route. And if you've made that, if you are at that point, 
then start reducing and, and seeing, seeing where it leads to. I mean, we're going to go on to David in a minute, but David has gone to the next level. Um, but before we go on to that, I'll, I'll, we'll come back to that question um, in, in a minute. But what I wanted to show you on here is, is the blue line is, so the green line is revenue. The blue line is revenue plus support. Okay? Now, just imagine in X number of years' time, 2027, 20, 2028, when there is no BPS and we do not know what Elm's replacement is going to be, you can see that the green line is the place that he is going to be if there was no support. So understanding where you are in your business right now, with and without support, is critical. And understanding where your profit, your, 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 the position of most profit, is also critical. And I repeat, if you treat nature as a stakeholder in your business, and you understand that there is this, this point at which nature and business coincide, you will be at MSO. Um, so I was just going to ask Chris a question, which I know I've, I've asked before, but um, it might help you guys a bit. But um, Chris, are we making an assumption that the revenue line is a straight line? Well, the, the revenue line is, your revenue is at that end point on, on the revenue line. We've just drawn a line from zero to, to that point to illustrate where the break-evens are. I think actually th probably the, the answer that I would throw out that is the starting point is know what both your costs of production are. That is, what is your cost of production and what actually is your cost of production in the field? And I think when you know what they are, you know what your spend is, you know where your margin is. When you know where your margins are, it's a whole lot easier to improve them, worsen them. Probably depends how you look at it. But by just knowing what all your costs are, then you can start going down a route of actually, you know, what, what do we need to spend and where, where do we sit in this? So... What, what we're doing here is bringing a, a, the sort of budgeting that takes place in industry into farming. And we've never, as far as I can see, had that in farming. And just to give you another feel, this, uh, David's fixed costs are that the red bracket on the left-hand side. And so if we reduce that from, what have we got, 60, 70, 80,000 pounds down to 50,000 pounds, then draw an imaginary line with the um, purple variable costs and, and see where the area of profit is, it is huge. So not only can you significantly improve the viability of your, f your farm business by moving to MSO, if you can get your, your fixed costs down to a level that is better, then you are going to have a significant improvement. We now know that fixed costs as a percentage of sales without support should be at 40% or less. Of the 80 farms that we have actually done, two are at that point. So when you do a, a hierarchy of decision making, um, output minus variable costs, minus fixed costs, minus drawings, no farm is making money with, with, without support. So with and unless we as businesses understand that, when BPS goes, we've got a real problem. So, David. So David asked us to do some analysis. He wanted to understand where he was now with his arable and where he would be if he started introducing cattle. And so this chart shows um, number one, current sales. Number two is um, the fourth level contribution, so that's output minus variable costs, minus fixed costs, minus um, uh, drawings. And third level, the third uh, uh, position is his fourth level at MSO. So you, you can just see what, what's happening, the significant improvement th that, that he is getting uh, with fourth level contribution um, compared uh, at where he currently is and where he would be at MSO with, um, with cattle and arable. So the blue is arable only, the cattle is orange, and every single time 
the rotation with cattle outbeat, uh, outdoes the arable side, purely arable. That natural fertility, that virtuous circle being introduced by livestock is having um, a significant effect. I think um, what was interesting for me, because I, I gave Chris the figures to put in here, and of course any analysis is only as good as the figures you, you give someone, but um, it, this is based only on reducing my corrective variable costs. So coming back to your question earlier, um, the other side of it obviously is improving how we can utilise our free issue goods. So making more use of the sunshine, making more use of the water, making more use of soil fertility. And actually by introducing cattle, something that hasn't been shown on here because I haven't put the figures in, is the fact that I'm going to be improving my usage of those free issue goods. So actually this probably isn't a fair representation of what introducing cattle to my business would be. It's like the least worst yeah. indication. Yeah. Questions? Any? All right. Uh, so, in terms of that, with adding the cattle in, then is the challenges around fixed costs because all of a sudden you've got two unit, you've got two units. Potentially, one of my earlier points was going to be around management because one of the things that seems to need seems to be critical to this is you're replacing sort of variable costs with improved management. Chris, is that that seems absolutely fundamental because I think we all know that. You know, taking Patrick's example, when I was talking about fungicides, an element of the fungicides some of us use is sometimes sort of almost an insurance policy. And if we're not using insurance type fungicides, we've got to be much better at, as managers, but much better as farmers ultimately, haven't we? Yep. Yep. But really, that point about that fixed cost, what's it going to do on that? Because I think that's always a challenge as a mixed farmer I have is we end up with two lots of fixed costs and often two units that are below maximum, perhaps maximum output. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a fair question. And again, it's only as good as the figures you put in. And from a fixed cost point of view, you know, we're, one of the main things I've been looking at today is how to introduce cattle into our system using herbal lays rather than housing them, trying to keep fixed costs down. Um, we're actually ex-dairy farmers, so we have got some infrastructure on the farm still. Um, it might be a bit like Clarkson trying to renovate that water system the, the other day on Amazon. But um, yeah, it, from a fixed cost, po fixed cost point of view, from the cattle side of the enterprise, I don't think there'd be too much more. But actually, the other thing it raises, obviously, is then we're farming less arable area, so our fixed cost per hectare on the arable area will then go up because we're spreading it over less less area. So yeah, there's lots of different connotations to it. Um, that's it's, you know, it's a fair point. Anybody else? Right, let's go to the next one. Uh, so we're looking at margin now. Uh, the first one is arable only. The second is with cattle, and the third is cattle with um, at at MSO. So, David's profitability would be significantly greater um, with cattle at MSO, with that's cattle and arable at MSO, at maximum sustainable output, than it would be with arable only, on the numbers that we've been given. This getting to grips with reducing productivity, if you like, production to drive profit is counterintuitive. But every single farm we've been on, and there's over 80 and lots more to come, there's not one that has exhibited any other characteristic. Not one. So here's, here's Patrick's chart. Okay, now, now you can see that Patrick's inflection point is a different angle to David's. So, uh, so, so um, he has a very different model. And do you want to talk about it? What you're doing? I can feel those doubts that everyone else is thinking <laughs> seeping into me at the moment. Because <laughs> every time I look at it, it still bamboozles me like a, like a rainbow. Um, <laughs> I think in, in being the guinea pig here, it actually does throw up a whole lot more questions as well. Um, and there's still questions that I have of Chris of this because I know there's things, there's anomalies in here. You know, there's, there's where we're investing in, in buildings, we're investing um, fixed costs into things that aren't necessarily generating income at the moment is number one. Um, the, no one here from the 
HMRC. There's a few things that maybe go down as hay that hay that shouldn't do. Um, and things that the, the accountant always says, don't let the tax tail wag the dog, but I think all farmers know the tax tail is quite a big driver in, in some of the things we do. So you know, we, we, we're trying to make sure that we've got a workable picture, which actually maybe isn't always the most accurate picture of our accounts. But our whole ethos is around how do we reduce those inputs all the time. And with this for this year, we're also thinking we're going to be reducing our nitrogen. We're reducing our, our artificial fertilizer reliance every year, but the price of nitrogen has just gone up by 70 pounds a tonne. So even though we're reducing our usage, our spend is probably going to be more than it was last year. So I'm going to be banging on Chris's door saying, why, why is this? Why, does, why doesn't this look any better? And partly because it's something that's completely out of our control. So for me, it's this, you know, this isn't the silver bullet, but what it does is it gives us that real guide as to where the whole business sits and, and are we heading in the right direction. And I think if we're not, then it's what are the reasons for that? And if the reason is the price of wheat, the price of wheat has plummeted or the price of nitrogen has increased, I, I can live with that because that is completely out of our control. So it's, it's kind of working on controlling the controllables is, is part of where we're looking at this as well. So I was on a Zoom with Patrick um, last week and suddenly it appeared to me that a light bulb had gone off. He looked more comfortable. It was a pretty low bar to start with, I have to <laughs> say, but it was a pretty dim bulb. <laughs> and what we started doing was going through um, productivity uh, in the way that I see it. And there are four. There's uh, physical, pro um, mechanical, biological, and chemical. Okay, so we don't see productivity as productivity per se. And so the physical comes from capital schemes, it, it, it refashions the environment, um, irrigation and drainage can be good or bad, depending on how, how good or bad the, uh, the, the, um, the, ins the installation was. But this is a balance sheet item, this is not a p and item. You then have uh, the mechanical element, this, this need to have big tractors and big machinery that sit in the yard or sit in the shed doing nothing for 48 weeks of the year. In industry, that would never be allowed to happen. In fact, it couldn't be afforded to happen. The only way that we can have all this big bit of kit is through the support that we're getting. So this comes from plant and machinery, um, tractors, harvesters, balers, good physical results, but comes with low plant utilization and something called rotor, poor rotor, return on total assets. And we use rotor on, in farming businesses to measure the success of that business in a different way. And it fundamentally affects the fixed costs, the repair bills, um, the, eight, the, um, the HP payments, fundamental to the, the fixed costs. And the, one of the problems of reducing fixed costs in farming is this big bit of kit. You then have the, the biological, the, um, the biologi biological productivity, breeding crop rotation practices, et cetera, et cetera. These are typically, uh, typically associated with pr the productive variable costs, the natural fertility, the, the free issue that, that we get. And finally, we have the chemical productivity, al almost universally detrimental, typically associated with the corrective variable costs. And when we were going through this, Patrick raised, the, put his hand up and jumped around and said, I understand, didn't you? <laughs> it, 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 this, it was a bit of a light bulb moment, to be fair to me, in that I had been struggling with the whole concept. Um, and just for me, I'm a bit of a pictures sort of person. When I see the graphs and the colors and the, the lines and the numbers, it, it sort of head spins. Uh, but actually, those four areas of productivity, that's where I can see. And I kept, I know on the Zoom call with Chris, I kept doing this. And for me, it's, it's how do we get that balance between all these things? So with everything we're doing, we know that if we can increase our biological productivity, you know, we know with wildflower strips, we increase, increase our, um, our pest predators and our beneficial insects, you know, we're, we're going to be reducing our insecticide bill. We know that if we're increasing our soil health, we're growing our cover crops right, we're growing our um, compost under the ground, actually the reliance on the blue bags uh, reduces. Then I think we all, we probably, there's a, there's a little bit of the machinery um, What's the word? Enthusiast in all of us. Uh, we all know that 
everyone in, in kind of our surrounding area, or certainly for us, everyone in our surrounding area has all the same kit that we do. We've all got a combine, we've all got a self-propelled sprayer, we've got three tractors, probably one too many, we've got about half a man too many. Um, because we can and because we might have another contracting opportunity that comes up and, and we want to make sure we're planning for all that. So we know that all those costs could be stripped out if we needed to. And actually, it's, it's just how do we get all these things in balance? So how do we bring our costs down but also increase our, our productivity in terms of everything that's there? And for me, just it's like one of those, when you watch one of those videos and the numbers, the four bars keep going up and down, it's how do we get all these things in balance? And, and that's when earlier when I was talking about the, just the gut feel that you have about your own farm. For me, seeing those four areas, I actually know where they all sit at the moment. And I know where they all are. And I kind of know what I need to be doing with it. It's just sometimes we're not quite brave enough to do it. Sometimes the funds aren't there to do it. Sometimes the knowledge isn't there. And every time we make a decision like that, I can see those four bars just kind of maybe realigning themselves a little bit. And that's, that's why it made sense to me at this point. I'm not suggesting it all made sense, but this bit of it certainly made sense to me. Comments? Questions? So I don't know what your systems are, but have you put grass into your arable rotations? Both of you? Have you? So we, we grow um, rye grass. We grow herbage rye grass for barren bugs. We have a, a two-year grass lay in our rotation as a seed crop. And yourself? Uh, yeah, we, we haven't got grass in there at the moment, but obviously with the cattle side of things, if we do go down that route, we'll be looking at sort of three, four-year herbal lays. At the moment, we're just doing cover crops in between sort of spring crops and, and winter crops. Well, we went organic four years ago and it was quite noticeable how all of a sudden you don't need this massive combine because you've, 20% uh, uh, of your arable area has gone to being grass. So you don't need this big combine and we still got it, <laughs> but it's, it's getting older and older, but it's, it's, it covers and the same with the all the storage. You don't, I know we're organic, it's a different matter, but for you guys, all of a sudden, 20% out of your total yield, that shed becomes surplus to requirement, so you could be used for other things. So you, you do change your whole look at things because all of a sudden you don't need such big tractors because you have got 20% gone into grass. You, yeah. Have you found that by putting it, rye grass in? I d we've been growing rye grass since the, since the 60s. Oh, okay. I, actually, the, the kind of the number one moment of efficiency for us was actually changing the combine header. So going from a, a conventional header to a stripper header meant the combine was going about three times as fast up and down the field and we didn't really know what to do with ourselves on day three of combining because we'd already finished. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, yeah, for us it's just it's working that whole rotation um, and then we're lucky that we actually have contracting opportunities to follow that. So we look at it and go, yeah, we've got a, we've got a big combine but actually we, know, we, we don't need it quite as big as that and, and maybe that is a kind of a model that the whole, uh, whole industry is going to be looking at as the the loss of subsidies comes, it's let's actually cut our cloth accordingly rather than what, what we thought was accordingly previously. And ha having thought about the, the cattle side of it, bringing it into what we're doing at home, when we moved from predominantly winter, ro well it was a complete winter rotation to a more diverse spring cropping rotation, that took the pressure off our system and we didn't have these really high harvesting pressure points and actually this would further that and I've, you know, I've already kind of dip my finger and having a little bit of pressure on at certain times of the year so that would add, add to the you know as well as being more profitable it's taking pressure off us as you know as human beings you know at t certain times of the year so it can only be good I think but Louise asked earlier have I got the cattle yet and no but um, having you know I, I'm part of a family partnership and if I just put my hand up one morning and say I think we should get some cows I know what they're going to say Whereas if I can go to them with a, with a written down, you know, a, s some sort of informed decision-making process, which is essentially what this is, I'm going to have to get Chris in to explain it to them. But um, <laughs> if, I, if I can go to them with an informed, you know, decision-making, you know, th this, is, this is the process I've been through and this is how it's going to be good, then that, that's the way forward. And that, that doesn't just count for, the, for me as a, um, as a, for our family partnership, it counts for the people that we contract farm for, um, as well because you know as, as things are going to move quite quickly in the next few years and informed decision making is going to be absolutely key. I just think it's really interesting a, a couple of comments one is about on the return on capital employed Helen Browning from the Soil Association said in a seminar the other day that farming makes negative one 
percent return on capital employed versus supermarkets make about six or seven percent. I think the productivity thing, I think that is really interesting because w and whenever we talk about productivity, I, I go into DEFRA and talk to government about this. Productivity tends to be blurred with production first. Secondly, we've just about established that it can be about reducing inputs as well as in increasing inputs and increasing yield. But going beyond that, I don't think it's unpacked in this way, so I think that's really helpful. I wonder if you could factor in labor productivity or human productivity, obviously for knowledge, you know, knowledge and skills of the workforce and add that into the equation. Um, and the last thing I wonder with your graph, whether you foresee adding what happens to when BPS goes down and Elm cuts in and how that starts to move your MSO to the right, because that starts to get really interesting about what happens when the whole package of support changes and drives the natural um, feedback loops, if you can put it that way. So, good question, but for me, I, if I was running an arable farm now, I would want to run it without any support, and if I got it, I would have that as cream and put it into my life, my, my pension scheme. You know, I, want to, I want to take the uncertainty, again in the, um, the previous um, talk on, on zero carbon, someone was saying we want to take back control and, and farmers should be taking back control. We want the business to drive farming, not farming to drive the business. And that's what we're talking about doing here. Yeah. The, the elms are going to be really important, but I, I just don't know. I want, I want to be, if it was me, I'd want to be in control. I mean, I think that's really interesting, and I heard Martin say that in the previous session, so I wonder if Elm is real well, because we su suspect, you know, Treasury's going to clamp down, and it might taper off anyway in seven years' time, whether it is about the motor to drive this shift into regenerative farming, and then it becomes really interesting, doesn't it? It does. Because it might be what triggers change. Yeah. I think that, that's where it's real value. Indeed, and, 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 and what these charts tell us is that anybody who believes they're going to trade their way out of farming, it won't work. The, the drive for, for more production in the belief that you're going to make money out of it, is a fa it will fail. Okay, so what are the features of MSO? Just as a bit, bit of a summary, uh, maximum profitability and margin, um, maximum contribution from nature, that sweet spot, nature as a stakeholder in your business, and we, I've worked with one partnership, arable partnership, where it's uh, granddad, dad, daughter, and son. They have partnership meetings around the kitchen table, and they now have another chair with the word nature on that. So that it just reminds them that nature is part of what they do and drives everything. If, you, if you're above MSO, which is where these two are, and I think every single other farmer in the country, apart from some now, are, maybe your organic isn't, I don't, but don't know. Um, if you're above MSO, those extra costs, when you're substituting for nature, the extra chemicals, fertilizers, it adds additional stresses into your um, farm business. And if you are below MSO, you are not exploiting nature in the way that it should be exploited in a managed landscape. So MSO is the point at which the natural capital delivers its maximum benefit, and maximum benefit occurs where you are at maximum profitability. Most farms, current situation in farming, most farms are working beyond MSO, as we've already, already did, uh, discussed. By coming down to MSO, you're going to increase biodiversity, you're going to improve fertility, improve animal health, increase profitability there will be an ine inevitable decrease in farm sector outputs. And so we're gonna have to start treating natural capital as a marketable product. We should be uh, selling biodiversity or um, carbon or whatever it is at some point when your business is, is in a position to do so. And we ought to be moving towards high quality branded produce um, in some way or another. We're gonna treat nature as a stakeholder We've got this free issue fertility in grass. Um, there is a benefit. If, if, if you are treating nature as a shareholder, it will be, be easier to make a profit. 
and we'll get a better return on total assets. So, last slide. What does the future hold? Well, we need, I don't know if you can read that at the back, we need to promote a proper balance with nature. There is a, this inextricable link between farming and nature, that sweet spot, keep saying it, there is this sweet spot. If we go, if we're not at that point, we're gonna adulterate the natural environment. And so this promotion of balance is absolutely critical. There will be this profitability improvement by reducing your CVCs and to operating at, at MSO levels, you will be more profitable, aggressively reduce the fixed costs. We have to, in our, in our industry, remove this commodity status that we're in. There is only one winner when you're dealing in a commodity, and that is the least cost producer. There's no other winner. We need to stop abattoirs acting as commodity traders. They are businesses. Um, this is for the livestock farmers, really, but um, the, the abattoir is, is a, is, should be going to a fee-paying um, uh, business because at the moment they're just driven by aspects of plant util utilization. They're driving economies of scale which farmers can't cope with. And finally, um, encouraging the, the, the development of ad added value. Anything you can do to add value um, is going to be fundamental to the success of your business in the future. Thank you very much. Now. <laughs> discuss. Questions, challenges. You can beat me up, you can beat those two up as well. Why do you say aggressively reduced fixed costs? Because if we're right that 40%, you should be, as a farm business, you be, should be at 40% of your output before support, and only two out of 80 farms have achieved that, and we're dealing with some farms that are 120% of, of, of their output, that needs an aggressive change. The only reason that they are surviving is because of 100, 150,000 pounds of BPS. Any more questions? You've made my head hurt. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a statement. Um, do you think in terms of the thing that really, it really jumps out at me, Chris, is the problem at the moment, and I look at my system, is we're caught in this sort of mid-way house, does it that make sense? That if I looked at my bits that are probably have, that are on your MSO of the farm, like my stuff that's in stewardship, it's probably making the least amount of money because it's having to carry the fixed costs for the rest. And what we fundamentally need is, and, and this very much relates to Elms, is a, a support system or a, a system that supports whole farm change because if we're just fiddling around the edges the fix the associated fixed costs are just far too high particularly probably even more challenging on a small farm where when you've got one tractor the next stop is no tractor I suppose you could have a smaller one but they get to the limit with these with that fixed cost isn't a straight line is it we all know that it's there's sort of some key there's some sweet points in fixed costs isn't there as well, and I think that's what I just, the whole concept I find really hard to get my head around in terms of how we change our businesses to get to fundamentally what we know, and I, I get that, that it works, it's just how we, how do we get there? Yeah, so, that's, a bit of a rant, that's, that's all right, I, um, the MSO cannot be treated on a field by field basis. It's a, it's a whole farm approach, yeah. okay? So, um, I, I, I don't know where you are, yeah, yeah, with, um, where you would be with your MSO, I have no idea. But I, I would bet you that you need, your fixed costs can be spread over the whole farm, not uh, just over the, um, the productive bits of that farm, okay? Does that help? No, no, it makes, what you've said does make, make sense. I think I've always looked at it is almost to get, I could almost look at our farm business by almost doing nothing would make it more profitable, and I think, 
you know, we've, we've all seen the figures for UK Agriculture PLC, where a lot of years it's the, the subsidy is less, is more than the profit. So almost the more you could take it to be very simple, we could all disappear. And I've had, I don't know, in bad years, some of the farmers said I'd be better off getting a ticket to Barbados and not doing any farming because I'd have more fun and make more money. And, and in, in many ways, I think, is that the big challenge? Because we don't, a lot of us don't want to go there. That's almost too uncomfortable. Yeah. To think so I should be really doing my consultancy work, not the, the farm bit, because I enjoy the farm bit. <laughs> well, that, that's, that, and that's the problem. There's a whole lot of emotion in farming, and particularly if you're a generational farmer, there's a whole lot of baggage that, 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 that goes with this. But the other thing I'd say is that you need to differentiate between economies of scale and economies of size. Yeah. Um, there's a, there, I believe that farm businesses are going to fail, and there's going to be a lot of aggregation. So if, if I was in, in these guys' position now, and maybe you lot too, I'd be planning to have finance available to buy land in 10 years, 20 years' time. 10 years' time, probably. Maybe less. And on, on, the, um, <coughs> on the point of Elms, looking forward, I don't think it's going to be anywhere near. Going down the system, which I hope the journey with the that we're on, looking at what Chris has found with our MSO, putting cattle into our system, I think farming with nature is going to make me more money than actually rewilding a bit and getting paid for just that bit to be, you know, to be pulled on the nectar or something else. Y yes, I'm going to have really marginal bits put into some, um, some habitat or whatever, but actually the key here is that the farming with nature is going to make me more money, and Chris's MSO is, is proving that to me. Um, that's the route I need to go down, and I need to pick out the bits of elms which are going to help me on that journey, but I don't think we need to kid ourselves that Elms is not going to be the saviour which some people are hoping it's going to be. Any more questions? So um, I've done my bit. These two are just going to have the final say and summarise, comment on, make observations. Pat? Yeah, I think for me now, when, uh, we've always talked about the journey and it always sounds a bit romantic about, oh, you know, we're, we're on this journey of change. Actually, I think now we're on a collision course with 2028. You know, we, we know what's coming, and we know it's going to be very different. So it's how do we set ourselves up, not quite to be the perfect farm business or the perfect farm, but how do we set our own business and our own farm up to make sure that in 2029, we're actually still there and we're still, we're still running in the black and, and we're doing it. Now, there's, there's many, many connotations of that. But for us, we've looked at it, and we have kind of redefined what marginal land means to us. There's actually a webinar on Friday, or whether I'm allowed to promote other organisations, we're, we're, we're part of a webinar on Friday, HTB, looking at marginal land. And for me, marginal land is a bit like saying min till or rewilding. It's a term that has many different connotations, many connotations to many different people. But actually, for us, it's the land that we can get the most out of in the most efficient way, in the straightest lines, that is what we're going to farm. And then the rest of it is what we're going to try and generate an income from. But we're now moving towards a way that how does this whole farm approach work for us? How do we work a whole farm ecosystem so our farmland biodiversity is benefited by the crops we grow and the non-crop growing areas? How, do our, how does our cover crops benefit our next year's crop, but also our farmland wildlife, also our grey partridges that need somewhere to hide when the combine um, is running through the late, you know, the late crops? Making sure that our whole farm is working as hard as it possibly can for us. And so when 2028 comes, we're in a position that we're still going to be there because that's the kind of the real crux of this now. And I think if we're all looking in the right direction and we're looking at where we can be, then there's no reason why you know, the industry won't be as buoyant. And as individual farmers, actually is what we're going to be considering more is how is our business going to survive into that, into that future and how are we going to be in a position to keep moving forwards? David? Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, I'm going to say thanks for sticking with us because this is a hard, hard subject, especially for the first evening of the first day at Groundsville. And it's a tough, you know, you've, you've stuck with us. Um, like the journey that we're all on, it's a work in progress. So with MSO, so you know, we're all learning. Chris is learning. We're learning. Um, it it works. Yes, there's you know, we've got a few little issues, and I think Chris, as as much as anyone, is enjoying the critiquing of it. To, develop it further and just ground truth it. Um, I'd really encourage everyone just to, to follow it, um, keep in touch with NFFN. Um, you know, it, it is going to keep moving on and keep changing, and we're going to learn as we go along. Um, and that, that's really my 
sort of message from this is um, is just keep in touch and, and watch how it goes because it is like Patrick had the light bulb moment. I've I've had it and it is a real game changer in looking and and benchmarking how we are moving as a business towards the sustainable system that's always going to be in the you know are we ever going to get there? Probably not, but it's we're moving towards that goal the whole time. So yeah. So that's it, really. Thank you very much, David and Pat, for, for, for being up, up there and fielding questions. I'll just leave you with this, that the only driver for your business is profit. Not yield, but profit. Particularly profit um, when support is gone. Thank you very much.